The first thing to understand about JavaScript is that it is not Java. JavaScript and Java are two totally separate languages. The confusion in the name stems back to the origin of JavaScript back in 1995 at Netscape, the makers of the first popular web browser Netscape Navigator. Brendan Eich was tasked with creating a new language that would be embedded in the browser, and he originally intended to call the language LiveScript, but the marketing people decided they wanted to ride the coattails of this other new language called Java, which was also being embedded in the browser, though in a different way. So Netscape and Sun, the creators of Java, reached a deal where Netscape could use Sun's trademark to call their language JavaScript. Originally, JavaScript was only implemented in the Netscape browser, but then Microsoft implemented it in their Internet Explorer browser, calling it JScript to avoid trademark infringement of the Java name owned by their rival Sun. A few years later, a standard for the language was created by a European standards body called ECMA, but they called the language ECMAScript. So that's actually the official name for the language, but in practice, everyone still just calls the language JavaScript. For most of its history, the vast majority of JavaScript code written has been written to run inside a web browser. The real reason JavaScript became popular at all is because it's been the only choice for code to run in all popular web browsers. For a long time, in fact, the only JavaScript interpreters that existed were those inside the browsers. In recent years, though, a few JavaScript interpreters have been created that run outside the browser, and they're beginning to pick up some use. For the first several years, JavaScript in the browser was used only to do very trivial things, largely because the JavaScript support in the various browsers was very uneven, creating lots of headaches to make JavaScript code run properly in all the different browsers. In the last decade, though, people have begun doing more and more ambitious things with JavaScript in the browser as the major browsers continue to optimize and expand their support of the language. When you write JavaScript code to include in a web page, your code sees the content of the page as what's called the DOM. The DOM, standing for Document Object Model, is the hierarchy of objects that represent the content of the web page. We can access and manipulate the elements of the DOM using a set of standard functions included in the browser's JavaScript interpreter. User interactions with the page can trigger JavaScript code to run, and that code can then manipulate the page in any way desired. So we can do things like, say, change the color of some text on the page when the user clicks a picture. In this unit, we're not going to cover the DOM or JavaScript in the browser at all. We're just going to cover JavaScript the language itself. The basic data types in JavaScript are really all the same things we saw in Pigeon. The only difference is that what Pigeon calls lists, JavaScript calls arrays, and what Pigeon calls dictionaries, JavaScript calls objects. It must be said that JavaScript chose poor terms. The term array in predating languages refers to something similar to a list, but not exactly the same, and the term object in programming is often used generically to mean any kind of value. So JavaScript is confusingly using object to refer to a specific kind of object, the kind which in other languages we call a dictionary or a map. In Pidgin, all of the operators are reserved words, but in JavaScript, as in most languages, most of the operators are symbols. The division operator, for instance, is a forward slash, and the multiplication operator is an asterisk. An even bigger difference with the operators is that, like most languages, but unlike Pidgin, JavaScript uses infix notation, the style of notation most commonly used in mathematics. So here we see x times 3 plus 9. Both the multiplication operator and the addition operator are binary operators. They take two operands, one on the left and one on the right. The question here then is which of these operations is performed first? Well, in infix notation, the operators have an assigned order of precedence, and the multiplication operator in JavaScript has a higher precedence, so the multiplication is done first. If we were to explicitly enclose each operation in a pair of parentheses, we'd put a pair around x times 3, and then we'd put another pair around the addition operation. For comparison, if we were to write this in prefix notation, it would look like this. Function calls in JavaScript also use the notation more traditionally used in math, such that the function precedes the parentheses and the arguments are separated by commas. So whereas in Pidgin we'd write paren, foo, abc, and paren, in JavaScript we'd write foo, paren, a, comma, b, comma, c, and paren. To call a function with no arguments, we'd simply leave the parentheses empty. Be clear that we specify the function of a call not just by name, but by any expression that evaluates into a function. In effect, you should think of the parentheses of a function call kind of like an operator itself, an operator that evaluates left to right. Here the function foo is called with arguments a and b, and foo itself returns a function which is then called with an argument c. If foo didn't return a function in this case, then the attempt to call it as a function would trigger an error. So here's the confusing part about infix notation. Whereas in prefix notation, a set of parentheses always denotes the invocation of an operator or the call to a function, 
In infix notation, they do not. In infix notation, we often have operations which are not surrounded in a pair of parentheses, and then also have expressions which are superfluously surrounded in parentheses. Here, for example, we have an expression of the variable foo, which simply evaluates into the current value of foo, whatever that may be. In infix notation, we can surround foo in as many pairs of superfluous parentheses as we like, and the expression remains unchanged. It's still just the variable foo. In prefix notation, though, we can't do this. We have to just leave it as foo with no parentheses, because in prefix notation, surrounding foo in parentheses calls foo as a function. If we want to call foo as a function in infix notation, we put the parentheses after the variable. Any extra parentheses surrounding the whole expression still don't do anything. Assignment in JavaScript is considered an operation, not a distinct kind of statement. The assignment operator is an equal sign, and you put the target of the assignment on the left and the value to assign on the right. For example here, the division operator has a higher precedence than the assignment operator, so the division here is done first. So bar divided by two, that value is assigned to the variable foo. If we were to write the equivalent statement in pigeon, it would look like this. The odd thing about assignment as an expression is that the target of the assignment, the thing which is the left operand, is not like an operand to any other operation, because it's not really an expression. The target doesn't evaluate into a value which is then used by the operation. Instead, the target specifies a variable to modify. In the JavaScript specification, targets of assignment are called L values, in contrast to normal expressions which are called R values. The L and R stand for left and right, as in the left and right side of the assignment operator. L values are things which can go on the left side of the assignment operator, R values are things which can go on the right. A simple variable name is the most common kind of L value, but as we'll see later, there are a couple more kinds in JavaScript. Another oddity about assignment as an operation is that it raises the question of, well, what does an assignment operation return? The answer is that an assignment operation simply returns the value it assigns. So this assignment operation here returns whatever value it assigns to foo. Because the assignment operator returns a value, we can chain assignments like this. Here the addition operation comes first because addition has a higher precedence than assignment. Then we do the assignments from right to left because the assignment operator is right to left associative, meaning that if we have a chain of them, we start on the right side and work leftwards. So 4 plus 2, that produces 6, which gets assigned to z, and then this rightmost assignment itself returns 6 to assign to y, and that assignment in turn returns 6 to assign to x. If we wrote parentheses around these operations to make their order explicit, it would look like this. In effect, every variable in the chain gets assigned the same value. Note that were the assignment operator left to right associative instead of right to left associative, chaining assignments wouldn't work. As you can see, that would mean assigning the value of z to the expression x equals y, but that doesn't make any sense. x equals y is not a valid kind of assignment target. It's not an L value. So in fact, the assignment operator is made right to left associative to make chaining assignments possible. Expression statements in JavaScript all end in semicolons. Here we have four expression statements. The first assigns the value 3 to x, the second assigns 2 plus x to cow, the third calls the function foo with the argument 1, and the fourth calls bar with no argument and assigns its returned value to rat. The reason for these semicolons is that JavaScript syntax is free of form, meaning that wherever the language allows or requires a whitespace character, you can put one or more whitespace characters of any kind. For example, here we have the statement 5 assigned to x written with white space in three different ways. In the first example, we just stuck to a sensible style, how the statement would most commonly be written, but as you can see, we can use different spacing and write the expression across multiple lines. Even if we normally wouldn't want to write it that way, it is legal JavaScript code. Having a freeform syntax does occasionally help us out, such as when calling a function with a verbose series of arguments, because then we can spread that call onto multiple lines. Most of the time, however, we're just going to write our code with the same indentation style we saw in Pigeon. Comments in JavaScript can be written in two ways. An end-of-line comment, a comment like in Pigeon, is written with a pair of forward slashes instead of the number sign. A multi-line comment, a comment that can extend across multiple lines, begins with a slash asterisk and ends with an asterisk slash. Note that with a multi-line comment, text after the ending asterisk slash is considered part of the code, even if it's on the same line as the comment. Here, the call to bar is code, not part of the comment. The deceptive thing about multi-line comments is that you cannot nest a multi-line comment inside another multi-line comment. Here, the language considers the comment to run from the first slash asterisk to the first asterisk slash, 
leaving lemon asterisk slash as part of the code. Identifiers in JavaScript conform to the same rules they do in Pigeon, except in JavaScript you can also use underscores and the dollar sign. So these are all valid identifiers in JavaScript. In Pigeon, we implicitly created variables by assigning to a previously unused name, but in JavaScript, we have to explicitly declare the existence of our variables using a var statement. The var statement begins with the reserved word var, followed by the name of the variable, and then optionally an assignment to give that variable an initial value. Here we're declaring a variable named monkey, and another named zebra, which is given the initial value 3. When we declare a variable but don't give it a value, its value is not null as you might expect, but rather a different value called undefined. So here, for instance, if we declare a variable named Jeff without any initial value and then pass Jeff as argument to a function, the parameter for that argument receives the value undefined. In contrast, a variable which hasn't been declared doesn't exist, and so if we attempt to use an undeclared variable, like Amanda here, that triggers an error. A function in JavaScript can be created with a function statement, which begins with a reserved word function, followed by the name of the function, then a comma-separated list of parameters in parentheses, and then a body enclosed in curly braces. What you see here is the most common formatting style, but again, JavaScript's freeform syntax allows for many formatting variations. So here we create a function with a name Helen, give it two parameters, apple and orange, and have it simply return the sum of the two parameters. We then invoke the function with the arguments 3 and 5 and assign the return value to a new variable Dan. An important thing to understand about a function statement is that it effectively doubles as an assignment statement because the name given for the function is actually just an ordinary variable. Here the function statement creates a new function value and assigns it to the variable Helen. If no variable Helen has yet been declared, the function statement implicitly declares it. A function in JavaScript can also be created as an expression, an expression which returns the new function as a value. The expression form has the same syntax as the statement form, except that we don't specify any name. So here we have an expression creating the exact same function as our previous example. For clarity, I've surrounded the function expression in orange parentheses, though the parentheses are not required. This expression in the parentheses returns a function value, just like the one created by the function statement, and then that value is assigned here to the variable Helen. So this code is actually precisely equivalent to our statement form example. The only difference is stylistic. Notice that JavaScript's freeform syntax comes in handy here because it allows us to approximate the usual indentation style of a function, even though we're writing the function in the middle of an assignment statement. Again, be clear that some programmers prefer to format functions differently, but this is the most common style. Now, when we create a new function and assign it to a variable, the statement form is obviously the most convenient form. But in some cases, we want to create a new function without assigning it to a variable. For example, we might wish to create a function simply to pass it as argument to some other function. In such cases, the expression form is more convenient because it allows us to create a function without having to give it a name. Like the arithmetic operators, the logical operators in JavaScript are symbols, not reserved words as they are in Pigeon. The AND operator, for instance, is written as two ampersands, the OR operator is written as two pipe symbols, and the NOT operator is written as an exclamation mark. The equality test operator can actually be written as just two equal signs instead of three, but three is usually the better choice because of a quirk of the language we'll discuss later. In JavaScript, the values null, zero, an empty string, and undefined are all considered to have the truth value false. This means that, for the sake of logical operations and condition tests, like of an if or a while, these values are treated the same as the Boolean value false itself. All other values, though, are treated the same as the Boolean value true. Here then, not true of course returns false, and not false returns true, but not null, not zero, not empty string, and not undefined all return true as well, because those values themselves are all considered false for the sake of any logic operation. Again, all values other than these five are considered true. Here, the first line returns true because 3 is equal to 3, the second line returns false because 3 is not equal to negative 2, and the third line returns true because the not operator has the higher precedence. Not true returns false, and then false is equal to false, returning true. This expression tests whether 3 is equal to 3, 
or 2 is greater than 4. And of course, 3 is equal to 3. So even though 2 is not greater than 4, the OR operation returns true because one of its operands is true. Note that the parentheses here could have been left out because the equals operator and the greater than operator both have higher precedence than the OR operator, and so would have been done first anyway. For stylistic reasons, though, it's often good to use superfluous parentheses to make the order of operations absolutely clear. If, else, and while in JavaScript differ only in syntax from their counterparts in Pidgin, the conditions must always be written in closed in parentheses, and the bodies are always written in closed in curly braces. Also note that there's no reserved word elif. Instead, you write else space if. So, for instance, here we have an if else with a condition x equals 3, and so when x does not equal 3, the function foo is called. Otherwise, the function bar is called. For this while loop, first we declare counter variable i with the initial value 0, then the condition tests whether i is less than 5, and then inside the loop we call the function foo and then increment the variable i by 1. So this loop will call foo five times. When inside a function, we use a variable name which has not been declared inside that function, JavaScript assumes that the name refers to a global instead of a local. Here, for instance, the function foo declares no local of the name bar, so JavaScript assumes that bar in the return statement refers to a global. However, executing this return statement when a global bar does not actually exist will trigger an error. So here, the call to foo after the function will trigger an error, assuming no global named bar was previously created. Here, though, we create a global bar before calling foo, and so the code runs fine without error. Unsurprisingly, a global must already exist when we try to use it. When functions use globals, though, those globals don't have to exist by the time the function is created, only by the time they are used when the function is called. In contrast to globals, local variables can be declared anywhere in a function, just as long as we put the declaration somewhere in the function. Here, the declaration of bar comes after the return statement, where execution will never reach. But local variable declarations aren't really executed, they simply exist. Local variable declarations are not really actions in the flow of execution, they simply annotate the set of local variables that exist in that function. So we could put this declaration of bar anywhere in the function we like. Common practice, though, is to simply put all local declarations at the very start of the function. Unlike in Pidgin, a function in JavaScript can be created inside another function. A function created inside another is often called a nested function. There are five things to understand about nested functions. First, a function statement inside another function assigns the newly created function not to a global variable, but instead to a local variable of the enclosing function. So here, inside the function foo, a new function is created and assigned to the local variable bar of the function foo. Second, variables declared in a nested function, including the parameters, are local to that function, not the enclosing function. Here, for clarity, I've highlighted the variables of the outer function foo in orange and highlighted the variables of the inner function bar in red. Again, note that the name bar itself is confusingly a local variable of the outer function foo. Third, be clear that nested functions are created in some particular call to the outer function. Each call to foo here creates another copy of the function bar. Fourth, a nested function can use the variables of the function call in which it was created. Here, each individual copy of the function bar can use the local variables of the particular call to foo in which that copy of bar was created. Now, function nesting may go deeper than one level. For example, say in some call to a function we'll call orange, say we create another function we'll call red, and say in a call to that function we create another function we'll call green. And let's say that the orange function has three variables, named a, b, and c, the red function has two variables, named a and d, and the green function has two variables, b and e. Well, in this scenario, each copy of the red function can use the variables of the call to orange in which that copy of red was created, and each copy of the green function can use those variables as well, but also the variables of the call to the red function in which that copy was created. The caveat is that some of these variable names conflict. Both the red and orange function, for example, have a variable named a. The way this gets resolved is that the more local variables take precedence. So the red function only sees b and c of the orange function, but not its a. And the green function sees a and d of the red function, but only c of the orange function. So if a name conflict prevents you from accessing a variable of an enclosing function, you can always just resolve the name conflict. 
For example, here, if we want to use b of the orange function in our green function, we could just rename b of the green function to some other name that doesn't conflict. Be clear that a nested function can modify an enclosing function's variables. Here in the call to foo, the nested function bar increments the variable a of foo, and so the call to foo returns 4, not 3. The fifth and last thing to understand about nested functions is that through a language feature called closure, a nested function can use the variables of the function call in which it was created even after that function call returns. Normally, the local variables of a function call disappear once the call returns, but closure preserves the variables for use by the nested function. Now, in our example here, the nested function bar is only stored in a local variable of foo, so the function bar disappears along with the local variables of foo when the call to foo returns. If, however, we return bar itself from the call to foo, or if we store it in some variable, array, or object outside the function foo, then the function bar will outlive the call to foo and so might make use of closure. Here, the nested function bar returns the sum of its parameter b and the parameter a of its enclosing function foo, and bar itself is returned from foo. So when we call foo with an argument 2, it returns a copy of the function bar for which the retained variable a of foo has the value 2. Likewise, when we call foo with an argument 3, it returns another copy of the function bar for which the retained variable a of foo has the value 3. So be clear, we have two separate copies of the function bar, one assigned to Greg and one to Lisa, and these copies differ in their closures. Each closure has its own set of the variables of the enclosing functions. The variable a in one closure is not the same variable a as in the other. So when we then invoke these two separate copies of bar with the argument 6, the copy stored in Greg returns 8 because 6 added to 2 returns 8, but the copy stored in Lisa returns 9 because 6 added to 3 returns 9. For another example, here the nested bar function has no parameter of its own but increments a of the enclosing foo function. We assign to Lisa the copy of bar returned by foo with an argument of 5, and then each time we invoke Lisa, it increments the variable a of its closure by 2 each time. So we get the values 7, then 9, then 11, and so forth. As I briefly mentioned, what Pigeon calls dictionaries, JavaScript calls objects. Objects in JavaScript are not created with an operator per se, but instead created with a literal syntax. An object literal is denoted by a pair of curly braces in which you list the key value pairs, though JavaScript actually calls the key value pairs properties. Unlike Pigeon dictionaries, the keys of a JavaScript object can only be strings, not numbers or any other kind of value. To access and modify the properties of an object, we use an operator which is a pair of square brackets. The brackets immediately follow some expression which evaluates into an object, and inside the square brackets we put a string expression which is the name of a property, that is, some key. So in this code, the first thing we're doing is assigning to foo a new empty object, an object with no properties. In the second line, we're assigning to bar an object with two properties. The properties are separated by a comma, and each property is written as first a string key, then a colon, then the value. So the first property here is the key bill with the value 2, and the second property is the key Diana with the value true. In the third line, we're assigning to act the value of bar's property named bill, which as we just said, currently has the value 2. In the fourth line, we're assigning to bar's property bill the value 3. Recall that when we discussed the assignment operator, we said that a symbol variable is not the only kind of L value, the only kind of valid target for an assignment. Well, here's the other kind, an assignment to an object property. In the next line, we're assigning to foo's property ned the value 8. Note though that foo until this point didn't have any properties, so this assignment actually creates a new property in foo named ned. In the last line, we're assigning the value of foo's property ted to ack, but because foo has no such property at this time, the expression returns the value undefined. JavaScript provides two syntactical shortcuts for properties. First, in our object literals, property names which conform to the rules of identifiers can be written without enclosing quote marks. Second, instead of using the square bracket operator, property names which conform to the rules of identifiers can be written with the dot operator, and again, no enclosing quote marks. Because Bill, Diana, Ned, and Ted are all strings which conform to the rules of identifiers, we can write the same code like so. Not only is this cleaner to look at, it's easier to type. Of course, you'll have to fall back on the verbose notation for property names which don't conform to the rules of identifiers. Also, understand that the expression inside the square brackets doesn't have to be a string literal. It can be any expression which returns a string value. 
Here, for example, we're specifying a property by the string returned from the call to Alice. For such uses, we can't use the dot operator. The dot operator only works when we want to specify the property name directly. The term method is basically a synonym for function, but it's used in the context of object-oriented programming to mean a function which is defined as an operation for some data type. We'll discuss the theory of object-oriented programming later. For now, suffice it to say that in JavaScript, the term method refers to a function which uses the reserved word this. The reserved word this is essentially a special kind of parameter, a parameter which gets its argument in a peculiar way. To illustrate, here we assign an empty object to foo, and then assign a function to the property bar of foo. This function assigns the value 3 to the property ack of the special parameter this. So how does this get its argument? Well, when the function property is accessed via the dot operator or square brackets and then called, JavaScript passes the object to this. So when we invoke foo.bar, foo is passed to this, and so in the last line here, foo.ack has the value 3. You might be wondering what gets passed to the special parameter this when we invoke the function without accessing it as an object property. Here we have the same setup, but instead of invoking the function via foo.bar, we assign foo.bar to a variable greg, then invoke greg. Without the property access syntax, there is no object specified to pass to the special parameter this. What JavaScript does then is pass the default global object, which is an object that represents the global namespace itself. Any global variable we assign is actually a property of this global object, and vice versa, any properties we assign to this object show up as global variables. So because the call to Greg assigns 3 to the property ack of the global object, we then have a global variable ack with the value 3. Now this behavior just described with methods and the global object really isn't useful at all. I suppose it was decided that passing the global object to the special parameter is better than passing undefined. In practice, though, methods should really just always be called as object properties, such that some specified object gets passed to this instead of the global object. The next question now is, how are methods useful at all? Well, to be honest, it's really just a syntactical convenience. We could get the same exact effect with a regular parameter. Here, for example, instead of using the special parameter this, we just give the function a regular parameter x to which we'll pass the same object. So in the call to foo.bar, we pass foo as the argument. Admittedly, this is a bit more verbose, but it achieves the exact same effect. However, for reasons that will become clear when we discuss object-oriented programming, it was decided that invoking a function as an object property and passing the object as argument is something we want to do commonly enough that it deserves a less verbose syntax. The last thing we'll note about the special parameter this here is that, unlike regular parameters, it can't be assigned values. Here, the assignment of 3 to this will trigger an error. An object in JavaScript can have a single link to some other object. The effect of this link is that when we access a property of an object, if the object doesn't have a property of that name, JavaScript will look for a property of that name in the object linked by the first object. So say we have three objects, an object orange with three properties, A, B, and C, a red object with two properties, A and D, and a green object with two properties, B and E. If the green object links to the red object and the red object links to the orange object, then via the red object we can access B and C of the orange object, and via the green object we can access C of the orange object and A and D of the red object. The way to think of this behavior is that accessing a property triggers a search for that name, a search that follows the chain of links until a property of that name is found. So notice that accessing the property A via the green object returns A of the red object, not the orange, because the search starting from green goes to the red object first. So let's see how this link behavior plays out in code. For now, we'll elide over how to create these links, just assume that object ack here links to the object bar, and the object bar links to the object foo. Well then, the expression foo.c equals bar.c equals ack.c will return true, because they actually all refer to the same property, the property c of the object foo. Bar and ack have no property C of their own, so accessing a property C on those objects follows the chain up to the foo object where a property of that name is found. Now if we then assign to bar.c a value 8, this creates a property C in the object bar. In fact, assignment to a property always affects that object itself. The link search behavior only applies when we access properties, not when we assign to them. Now that bar has its own property C, the expression ack.c will return the value of that new property in bar, but foo.c will still return the value of its own property c. It turns out that the basic types in JavaScript, like strings, numbers, and arrays, can act in some ways like objects. 
A string, for instance, has a property named length whose value is the number of characters in that string. For instance, this string hello has a property length with a value 5 because the string has 5 characters. Be clear though that strings aren't really objects. You cannot assign to a string's property length or assign the string additional properties. Strings do, however, all have a link to another object, a special object which contains methods useful for strings. One such method is charAt, which returns the character of the string at a specified index. When I invoke foo.charAt1, the method returns a string of one character, the character at index 1 of the string hello, which is the second character e. Again, the indexes here start from 0, such that 0 is the first character in the string. In the last line, when I invoke charAt on the string avast with an argument 3, the method returns the character s, the fourth character of the string avast. Understand what's going on in these calls. Though the strings themselves have no property charAt, the string is linked to an object which does, and because we invoke charAt as a property via the strings, the strings get passed to the special parameter this in charAt. Also understand that what this arrangement accomplishes is really nothing we couldn't do without methods, properties, or object links. We could instead just have a regular function charAt in the global namespace to which we would pass both a string and an index. This arrangement, however, is a bit more convenient and neatly keeps the global namespace uncluttered. To create a link from one object to another involves the new operator. The new operator is a unary operator which takes as its operand a call to a function. What the new operator does is pass a newly created object to that function's special parameter this, and what the function then returns, regardless of any return statement, is that newly created object. So here, when we invoke this function tom with the new operator, a newly created object is passed to the special parameter this, the object then gets assigned two properties, foo and bar, and the newly created object is returned and assigned to the variable jane. Now it turns out that every function value has a property called prototype, an object which starts out empty when the function is created. When we invoke a function with the new operator, the newly created object gets linked to this prototype object. So here, if we create a property ack in the prototype object of tom, we can then access ack via the jane object because the jane object links to the prototype object of tom. Again, the JavaScript equivalent of what Pigeon calls a list, JavaScript calls an array. An array is created with a literal syntax of square brackets enclosing a list of values separated by commas. To access, modify, or add items, we use square brackets much like we do to access, modify, or add properties of objects, except inside the brackets we put a numeric index rather than a string. So here for example we assign the foo an empty array, and then assign the bar an array of three items, the number 4, a string hello, and the number 33. We then assign the ack the item of bar at index 2. In other words, the third item of bar, the value 33. Lastly, we assign the index 3 of bar a string orange. Because bar previously had no item at index 3, this effectively expands the size of the array by 1. Unlike pigeon, we don't have to explicitly expand an array with an append operation. We can instead simply assign to any index, whether the index is currently in range of the array's current size or not. In fact, the dirty secret of JavaScript's arrays is that they are really just objects in disguise. The item of an array at, say, index 2 is really just a property with the name numeral 2. So if you write these numeric indexes as strings, the code actually functions just the same. The only way arrays really differ from objects is that arrays have a special property called length, which is meant to report the number of items in the array. In truth though, what the length property actually reports is the number which is one higher than the greatest numeric property name. So here, foo.length returns 0 and bar.length returns 3 as we should expect. However, if we then assign to index 15 of bar, bar.length returns 16, even though we've only added one more item. All the indexes from 4 to 14, such as index 8, remain undefined. So understand that there are scenarios in which the length property will actually misreport the number of items in an array. Inside a function, JavaScript always includes a special local variable called arguments. The arguments variable holds an array of all the arguments passed to the function. Whereas in Pigeon, a function must always be called with the same number of arguments as the function has parameters, in JavaScript a function can always be called with any number of arguments. When a function is called with fewer arguments than the function has parameters, the excess parameters get the value undefined. When a function is called with more arguments than the function has parameters, the only way to access these excess arguments in the function is via the arguments array. 
Using the arguments array, we can write a function which sums together all the arguments passed to the function, no matter how many arguments are given. We'll call this function sum, and notice it has no parameters. In the function, we use a variable sum to keep tally of the value we're going to return, and we use a counter variable i to step through each item of the arguments array in a loop. i starts out at 0 and gets incremented by 1 at the end of each iteration, and the condition tests whether i is less than arguments.length. So the loop will iterate with i incrementing from 0 up to, but 1 less than, the length of the arguments array. In each iteration, we take the item of the arguments array at index i and add it to our sum. Once the loop completes, we return sum. So if we call the sum function with the arguments 2, 2, and 3, we get 7. Sum with arguments 5 and 7 returns 12, and sum with no arguments returns 0, because when the arguments array is empty, the loop is never entered, and so the initial value of sum, 0, is returned. In describing JavaScript and Pigeon, I've occasionally mentioned how some code will trigger errors. JavaScript calls these errors exceptions. For example, using an operator on the wrong kind of operands triggers an exception. Here, multiplying a string by a boolean triggers an exception because the multiplication operator doesn't accept those types as valid operands. Normally, when an exception occurs, the program will terminate. However, exceptions triggered in a try block will be caught, allowing the program to continue executing despite the error. Here, the same multiplication of a string in boolean is in a try block, so when the exception triggers, execution skips over the rest of the try, jumping immediately to the try's accompanying catch clause. The catch clause includes a single variable name in parentheses, which acts something like a function parameter. We're free to name this variable whatever we want, but I always like to call it x, short for exception. This variable is local to the catch clause, so it disappears once execution leaves the catch block. The value passed to this variable is what's called the exception object, an object with information about the exception which is generated when the exception is triggered. In the code of the catch clause, we may choose to use this exception object, or we may simply ignore it. Again, what happens here is that the multiplication operation triggers an exception, an exception object describing the error is generated, and execution jumps to the catch block where the exception object passed to its parameter. Now, the idea behind all of this is that the programmer may be able to handle, as we say, some kinds of errors. Be clear, though, that for some kinds of errors, the program really can't do anything better in their eventuality other than simply terminate. In this artificial example, the real proper thing to do is not catch this erroneous use of the multiplication operator, but rather just fix the bad code. In other cases, however, the programmer might be able to cope with the eventuality of some kinds of errors. The classic example is what might happen when a program opens a file. If a program is reading a file from a USB thumb drive, one thing beyond the program's control is whether the user might yank out the thumb drive at any moment. What the program can do, however, is catch the exception triggered when this happens, and then do something like display an alert message telling the dummy user to plug the drive back in. So there's a reason we call them exceptions. Exceptions are the uncommon eventualities, the exceptional circumstances, which our program should account for to the best of its abilities. As already explained, erroneous uses of language features, like the built-in operators, trigger exceptions. It's also possible, though, to deliberately trigger your own custom exceptions. At certain points in your own code, your logic may be able to detect some circumstances that prevent the code from proceeding as normal. For example, a function may determine that the argument values passed to it are no good, such that the function cannot complete its normal task. In such a case, it makes sense to deliberately trigger an exception. This is done in JavaScript with a throw statement, the reserved word throw followed by the object describing the exception, the so-called exception object. Most simply, the exception object can be just a string. Here, the throw statement triggers an exception with a string as its object, and execution jumps to the catch block, passing the string to the parameter x. Again, the code in the catch may simply ignore the exception object if we so choose. The last big thing to understand about exceptions is that an exception not caught by a try block will propagate up the chain of function calls. What this means is that if we have some function in which an exception is triggered but not caught, execution will jump out of the function, and the exception will propagate to where the function was called such that the exception must be caught there, lest it propagate again. This will happen ad infinitum until the exception propagates to the top level of code, and if not caught there, the exception will terminate the program. So here, for example, if an exception is triggered and not caught in the call to foo, execution of foo will end early, and the exception will propagate to where foo was called. Because the call to foo is in a try block, the exception is caught, and execution jumps to the catch block. 
Here, however, where Ak calls Bar and Bar calls Fu, when an exception in the call to Fu is not caught, the exception propagates to where Fu was called, and because the exception isn't caught there, it propagates to where Bar was called, and because the exception isn't caught there, it propagates to where Ak was called. And finally, because the exception isn't caught there either at the top level of code, the exception terminates the program. So that covers the mechanics of exceptions. However, understanding when exactly you should trigger and handle exceptions is a trickier subject, part of what we broadly call error handling. Honestly though, you can avoid doing much error handling until you start writing programs of significant length. It may actually be a good while before you deal much with exceptions in your code.